In this video, I'm going to prove the reciprocal law. So given that we have a function called g, where the limit as x tends towards c is equal to m, I'm going to define another function called h, where h of x is defined as 1 over g of x. And then now what I want to prove in this video is that the limit as x tends towards c for h of x is equal to 1 over m. So another way to express this statement is to write it out like this. So this is equivalent to showing that we can move the limit down to the denominator. So this is what I want to show in this video. And in order to establish this result, what I need to show is that for whatever value of delta that you come up with, I can always find a value of delta larger than zero, such that if x is within a distance of delta away from c, then this immediately implies that h of x is within a distance of epsilon away from 1 over m. Or of course another way to write this is to use 1 over g of x is within a distance of epsilon away from 1 over m. So this is the statement that we need to establish in this video. So in order to establish the epsilon delta definition, we need to first take care of this term over here. So we need to make sure we can make this term arbitrarily small, as long as we make x sufficiently close to c. So I'm going to start off by manipulating this term a bit, and it will give us a hint on what, we, what exactly we need to do in order to establish this proof. So I'm going to start off by combining the terms. So this entire term just becomes m minus g of x divided by n times g of x, and then I can separate some of the terms. I'm going to pull this. We have an absolute value of m, and then we have this absolute value of g of x, and then we also have an absolute value of g of x minus m. So I just flip the terms, it doesn't really matter because it's inside an absolute value sign. So what I need to do now is to find a value of delta, so that if x is within a distance of delta away from c, then I can somehow make this term smaller than epsilon. And if I can indeed find a value of delta that can achieve this, then I would have essentially established the epsilon delta definition. So what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to go through the specific steps behind how we can actually find this value of delta so that I can make this term smaller than any arbitrarily chosen epsilon that we choose. So the first thing I'm going to do is to note that for the function g, the limit exists as x tends towards c. So I'm going to use this fact, and because of this, I know that there will always exist a value of delta. I'm going to call it delta 1, such that if x minus c is smaller than delta 1, then this implies that g of x minus m is smaller than the absolute value of m divided by 2. So you might be wondering why I chose this value. This is going to eventually help us establish the epsilon delta definition. So things will work out in the end for this choice. Uh, so if this seems arbitrary to you at this point, just bear with me. In the end, you will see that everything will work out uh, for this particular value I've chosen. And now I'm going to invoke a slight variation of the triangle inequality. So I'm going to use the rule that the absolute value of a minus the absolute value of b is always smaller than or equal to the absolute value of a minus b. So I'm not going to prove this in this video. You can look this up yourself if you're unfamiliar with this. So I'm just going to use this directly. And then you see that I can actually flip a and b around. So I can put b minus a for the right hand side. So you see that similarly, the absolute value of b minus a is all also smaller than or equal to the absolute value of a minus b. So it doesn't matter if you flip the sign inside the absolute value sign. So the point is the absolute value of a minus b and the absolute value of b minus a is always smaller than or equal to the absolute value of a minus b. And since b absolute value of b minus absolute value of a is just a negative of this number, then another way to express, to combine these two statements is to say that the absolute value of the absolute value of a minus the absolute value of b is smaller than or equal to the absolute value of a minus b. So this is, is a result that I'm going to use. And I'm going to use this, first of all, by plugging in g of x in place of a. And then for b, I'm going to plug in m. And then we know that this expression is always smaller than or equal to a minus b, so g of x minus m. And then we know that if x is within a distance of delta 1 away from c, then this term is smaller than the absolute value of m over 2. So this term over here will be smaller than 
the absolute value of m over 2, provided that x satisfies this condition. And so we have something like this. So you see that we have the absolute value of g of x minus the absolute value of m, and then the absolute value of the entire term is smaller than the absolute value of m divided by 2. And another way to express this is to take away this outer absolute value sign. So I'm going to take away these two terms, and then I can express this relationship in such a way. So the absolute value of g of x minus the absolute value of m is between the value, the negative of absolute value of m over 2, and the value of uh, uh, absolute value of m over 2. So this is another way to express this same statement. I'm just taking away the absolute value sign and then putting the negative of this term over here to the left. And then I'm going to add each term uh, by the absolute value of m. So this side, it becomes the absolute value of m over 2. The absolute value of m cancels out with this term, so we just have the absolute value of g of x. And then I'm going to add another absolute value of m, so we have 3 over 2, the absolute value of m. And so continuing, moving on, I'm going to now divide each term by the absolute value of m. So we have uh, 1 half g of x divided by the absolute value of m, and then 3 over 2. And then I'm going to divide each term by g of x. So we have 1 over 2, the absolute value of g of x, 1 over m, and then 3 over 2, the absolute value of g of x. And then now I'm going to multiply each term by 2. So you see that the 1 over the absolute value of g of x is always smaller than 2 over the absolute value of m. So I'm, go I'm going to drop this term because this is not going to help us. Uh, I'm going to use this result over here. So this is what we have established. We've established that if x is within a distance of delta 1 away from c, then we know that 1 over the absolute value of g of x is smaller than 2 divided by the absolute value of m. So this is a useful result that we're going to use later on. So now I'm going to establish another preliminary result that's going to eventually help us. And I'm going to once again use the fact that this limit exists to help us. So using that fact, I know that there will always exist a value called delta 2, such that if x minus c is smaller than delta 2, then this implies that g of x minus m is smaller than epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of m squared, where epsilon is a completely arbitrary term. So it's because I know that the limit exists for g of x as x tends towards c, so that no matter how small this value of epsilon is, I, I'm always certain that I will always be able to find a value delta 2 such that this statement is true. So you see that right now we have two values of delta. We have this delta 2, which if x minus c is smaller than delta 2, then this will be true. And then we also have this delta 1. And it seems like I made a out of brain malfunction, this, there should be a smaller, the, smaller than sign over here. So we have this delta 1 and we have this delta 2 defined. And now I'm going to define another term called delta, which is equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. And by uh, defining delta to be the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, if x minus c is smaller than delta, then immediately this statement over here, as well as this statement over here, will both be satisfied. And so the conclusions drawn over here and over here will immediately be true. So because delta is equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, if x minus c is smaller than delta, I'll immediately know that g of x minus m is smaller than epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of m squared. And I will also know that 1 over the absolute value of gx is smaller than 2 divided by the absolute value of m. So this is going to be something that's going to help us uh, when, we're, when we finally establish the epsilon delta definition, which is what we're going to do next now. And now we're finally ready to establish the epsilon delta definition. So we know that for whatever value of epsilon, I am now going to define delta to be equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2 with delta 1 and delta 2 defined in such a way. So delta 2 is defined in such a way, and delta 1 is defined in such a way. Delta 1 is a number such that this statement is true, and same goes for delta 2. So uh, by establishing delta 1 and delta 2, I've defined the value delta, and then we'll see that if x minus c is smaller than delta, then this will imply that 1 over g of x 
minus 1 over m, which we know is equal to, so based on our work over here, we know it's equal to 1 over m times 1 over g of x times g of x minus m. So we know that this term is equal to 1 over absolute value of m divided by 1 over absolute value of g of x times absolute value of g of x minus m. And then since we know that x minus c is smaller than delta, and delta is the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, we immediately know that these two statements are also true. So we know that 1 over g of x is smaller than 2 divided by the absolute value of m. So we know that for this expression, this is smaller than 1 over the absolute value of m times 2 divided by the absolute value of m. And then we also know that g of x minus m is also smaller than this term, epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of m squared. And you can see that all these terms will cancel out, which makes this term equal to epsilon. And so what we've been able to conclude over here is that for whatever arbitrary value of epsilon that you, can, that you choose, I can indeed always find a value of delta. So there does indeed exist a value of delta, such that if x minus c is smaller than delta, then 1 over g of x minus 1 over m is smaller than epsilon. So if we can make this term over here arbitrarily small, uh, provided that x is sufficiently close to c. So there always exists a value of delta, because we know that delta can just be equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. And for this value of delta, uh, we know that x minus c smaller than delta will imply that this term is smaller than this arbitrary value of epsilon. So essentially, we have established the epsilon delta definition. So we have proved this statement over here.